This is the start of a new project. This is a machine I've been looking for for a very long time and I've worked on dozens of these but I've never actually owned one and a subscriber was kind and generous enough to send me this so uh, thanks for that Dave, it's much appreciated. It's come to a good home and uh, this is a very nice addition to my collection. As I said, it's a machine I've been looking for for a very long time. Some of you may recognize the case. It came in this really nice case. So uh, protects it well, looks really nice. But we'll get this opened up, I'll get the machine out and uh, we'll take a look at it. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you knew what was in the case, and it is of course an HP 85B. These are uh, very nice machines. They have a really good display. It's quite a small display, but it's very good and clear. Really nice uh, keyboard, although um, there are issues with the keyboard on many of these, if not all of them. And uh, we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but this machine uh, basically works. I haven't taken it uh, apart yet and there are issues with it that I know about already. Uh, I have been playing with it but the only things I've done to this so far are to replace the fuse and uh, to adjust the brightness. That's uh, all I've really done with this. Um, the things I know that it does need to uh, work on are the tape drive. I've had a look inside and I can see that needs some work. I'm not going to put a tape in that as it is at the moment. It would destroy the tape and a lot of the keys stick down uh, when you press them. That's a well-known fault with these. It's part of uh, an issue with the design of the keys themselves. So we'll need to repair those. Uh, while we're on the subject of keys, I thought some of you might find it interesting if I just point out some research I did about 20 years ago. I've carried out a lot of uh, development work over the years and uh, about 20 years ago I was working on a project where I had to uh, scan a keyboard in real time using a single embedded microprocessor while at the same time using the same processor to decode a serial data stream. It might sound like a bit of a trivial task but it's actually surprisingly complex but not necessarily for the reasons you might think. Humans are very sensitive to using things like keys and in particular how long it takes for the key to respond when you press it. You might think that um, on a kind of global scale it uh, doesn't really matter and if the key responds fairly slowly, um, this is relative of course, but something like half a second you think it would be okay. But it's actually not. Humans are very sensitive to even very short delays. So I did some research at the time and I set up a test and it was kind of a blind test. The people that were involved didn't really know what the test was about. In fact, they all guessed that it uh, was something completely different. But all I did was set up a, a dummy of the piece of equipment that was being developed. It had 20 keys on the front and um, the, basically the people in the facility were just asked to three times a day type in a 10 digit code. Um, but I changed the firmware uh, every day so that one or more of the keys had a long delay. So. Um, they started off with a one millisecond delay and the delay by the way is to debounce the key and that's what I was trying to figure out is what the best debounce period was and also the hold down for key repeat. Debounce if you're not familiar with it is when you press the key um, the contacts actually bounce a few times. When you press the key they close and they bounce open and close a few times before they finally stay shut. So when you're using a high speed uh, processor because it's running so fast if you read the key um, and because I was making a real-time system I had to use an interrupt to read the key. Um, when the interrupt first occurs it's triggered by the closure of the key toggling one of the pins that's reading the uh, keys themselves. But when the uh, processor goes back to look at the key it might have already bounced open uh, or it might be that if the delay is too short that it sees the bounces as separate key presses so it might see the key being pressed more than once. So you have a debounce um, which is kind of a dead period where when the key is first detected as being pressed there's a delay before the processor goes and rechecks the key to make sure it is actually being pressed. Now if that delay is too long the user might have given up and released the key. If it's too short it might still be in the bounce period and then it won't properly read the key. You'll, you'll get kind of flaky behaviour of the unit. 
but it turns out that's quite a uh, a fine window of operation as to what people will uh, accept to find a keyboard nice to use. And in fact, I printed off some of the results I got. They were quite surprising at the time. So this is just a summary of the results. So they were very involved in what the firmware did. Is it recorded the time the key was pressed for each key press for each individual they all typed in their unique codes on you who was typing it in and uh, how long they pressed the key for and how hard they pressed the keys so there was a four sensor and the firmware monitored the time the key was held in and what was surprising was that um, I started off with a one millisecond debounce so it was a one millisecond delay before the key responded when it was pressed uh, and then how many of the keys on the keyboard, there were 20 keys on the keyboard, uh, how many of the keys had a, uh, a longer de delay set. Now when all the keys were one millisecond, there was quite a widespread of, uh, these. this is the average product of the force and time the key was pressed, in other words how long and how hard the key was pressed. And this is the average for all the keys on the keyboard. And what was surprising is that it didn't matter if just one of the keys was kind of sticky. Um, if one key on the keyboard was sticky and took longer to respond, then the users pressed all the keys much harder and for much longer, even if some of the keys operated much more quickly. And the other thing that was surprising was the first four uh, subjects are female, and they invariably press the keys twice as hard as the male subjects, which was quite surprising. So the females tend to sort of mash down the keys much harder and the guys seem to uh, be more, I don't know if they were more aware that the keys might not work in the way they wanted them to, but um, as I say, the uh, one group was pressing the keys twice as hard. And as I say, it made no difference if one or all of the keys um, was uh, slow to respond. The average was the same across all the keys. They pressed all the keys uh, approximately the same irrespective. And uh, what was very clear is that the um, product of time and force went up very rapidly once you go above a certain threshold. The threshold was about 60 milliseconds. So anything slower than that, and it's only about uh, just over a twentieth of a second, so it's quite surprising that in that short time, if it took longer than that for the key to function, they pushed all the keys down very much harder and generally doubled the force and duration. Uh, sometimes it was nearly four times the force and duration um, for the key being pressed if it took longer to respond. So that's one of the reasons you can end up with situations like this, that if there's a light touch which is all these need, the keys will probably last forever. There's no real reason why these keys should fail. We'll look at the failure mode in another video, but um, when we come to repair this, but um, really what causes these keys to fail on these particular keyboards is they're just pushed in way too hard. Now, of course, the key should survive that. They shouldn't really break because they're being pushed in too hard, but the failure mode is almost certainly the fact that the keys are being pushed in way too hard. Uh, okay, so that's one repair that we'll have to carry out. This also uh, randomly fails uh, memory tests. It's fairly um, uh, few and far between. It's about 1% of the time it fails a memory test. Um, and also the machine will hang every so often, which I suspect is part of the same thing. I don't think it's the memory itself. I think it's something else. But we'll come back to that in a future video. As I say, we need to get the tape drive sorted out. The printer works. Um, the guy that sent this was kind enough to send me a roll of paper, um, it's a thermal printer, and um, that actually works. The paper doesn't quite fit, it's a bit too wide, so it's got a habit of jamming up, um, but I can quite easily shorten that uh, roll. So what I'm going to do now is we'll take the top cover off. If I want to do first is I'll power this up so you can see it working, and then we'll uh, sort of demonstrate the fact that uh, some of the keys stick. So I'll get this powered up wait for the screen to come to life and this has basic built-in so another nice thing about it so all I'll do now is lower the camera so you can see the screen so as you can see quite a nice clear display and it's got full uh, live syntax checking so if you just type in something random you'll get 
uh, it will check the line as you enter it and you'll get a sensible error and there is a, obviously a, a list of all the errors and uh, this is running basic so we can just enter a basic program I won't do that now I'll do that in a future video um, but it's actually quite a nice version of basic this runs and you can of course save programs and load programs from tape and again we'll do that in a future video when we come to repair the tape drive uh, for now what I'm going to do is take the cover off we'll have a look inside and uh, see what we're up against but uh, one thing that I do know we need to uh, look at are the keys so I'll just move the camera so you can see what I'm talking about so the keys that take the most hammering on the a standard QR to keyboard are the ones in the middle row and the ones uh, really J, K, L, S, D and F they're the ones that tend to get the uh, most forces applied simply because this finger is going to press uh, hard or tends to press harder than the others so as you can see if I press L the L key sticks down and like with all keys on these machines it can be a real pain getting it back up again it kind of gets wedged in there and we'll look at that in a future video so uh, what we'll do now is I'll get the cover off and we'll take a peek inside I've removed the screws from the underside taken the paper reel out and removed the cassette eject knobs this should now lift off it does and as you can see the inside is very neat and tidy just interestingly if you haven't seen one of these before the inside is shielded so very nice thorough job they made of this and um, there is a date on you know, what appears to be a date I don't know if it's particularly meaningful um, but it looks like it says 0191 once I think it's a, a 91 machine uh, we'll look at some of the date cards on the ICs and uh, see if that confirms it so looking inside the machine you can see it's a very nice neat clean layout it's also a remarkably clean machine there's hardly any dust in this at all I don't know if the owners uh, previously cleaned this out but it's uh, very nice and clean so very easy to get to most of it and once you've hinged up the keyboard uh, it's quite easy to get to the uh, main PCB which sits underneath so you can see the main uh, processor sits underneath the keyboard so once you've got the keyboard out of the way it's very accessible so what we'll be doing in the next video of course is I think I'll start by addressing the keyboard issue so we'll look into the keyboard they are fairly easy to repair there's nothing particularly complex about them and um, we'll go from there we'll look at the uh, main processor board and try and figure out if there are any faults on that uh, and then we'll get on to the cassette mechanism itself and see what needs to be done with that it's a bit dirty, it might just be dirty actually but um, it's fairly sticky so okay so we'll get on to that uh, in a future video I can see that the head definitely needs cleaning and the roller is uh, pretty much gone so that will need to be sorted out and uh, should make quite an interesting project